So it's over to me um, as the last speaker. It's um, what I was hoping to present was a little bit of a, a summation of the various presentations we've had today, and um, at the end, really touching on uh, a number of the topics about communicating education and awareness, and particularly um, as all of us work in local governments. An interesting group that is missing from this room are, of course, the elected members. And they're really quite important in this process. And I'll be finishing with uh, some imagery uh, that we will get the opportunity to go and see about where, when you don't get the connection with elected members right, things can actually go very, very wrong. So I'd like to finish on a high note, but it's actually an important note for all of us to, to, to take home. We're all here representing various groups. This is Cambridge Coast Care, who are co-hosting today's event. But we're all representing a whole range of wonderful volunteers, which, uh, of course, surround this entire continent. And it's a great uh, work that we all do. The, the materials that we've heard today are all part of the fauna and the flora work, and the statutory and the controls and the wisdom that we've received are all about learning new ways and new opportunities to work with our coastline. But I remind you that we live on a coastline, the west coast particularly, that fits all of these. It's, it's very high energy. It actually has a very young geology. We like to think that we live on an old landscape, but it's actually a, a, a complete infant compared to the old stuff, the old continent that we live on, which is, is at the two to four billion year mark. We're sitting here on sediments that are about uh, 60,000 years old. So very young indeed. Of course, we all want to live. 80% of Australians live uh, within 50 kilometres of the coast. We all want to live there. But there are issues around that. And of course, uh, Ashley presented, I think, a very sobering issue around this very young geology, the very dynamic coast, and the planning needs to work with that. For our restoration, we have all sorts of constraints. We heard from Dave Merritt about things like salt, this whole issue with wind, they are nutrient poor, limited water holding, and they're very alkaline. That presents particularly interesting issues for us because almost everyone else who does terrestrial restoration in this country have to deal with uh, nutrient poor, limited water. They actually deal with, of course, highly acidic systems. And so that presents particularly interesting uh, challenges sometimes with our propagation, but it also gives us great opportunities. Along our west coast, we have about 1,200 plant species. It's not a lot compared to the 12,000 total that we have for the whole of Western Australia, but compared to something like the Mediterranean coastal communities, or any uh, particularly the USA coastal communities, we, we have an order of magnitude of about five-fold the diversity of coastal communities that they have. A few of these species we share with other continents. It's rather unusual. If you go to the Northern Hemisphere, particularly um, around Europe, you'll see lots of shared species. But it's interesting that, um, as we would have seen in Dave Merritt's talk, uh, the one where you could actually see the outline of Australia, but not the line of Australia's coastline, with Spinifex longifolius, our coastal Spinifex, actually grows right around the coast. Our coastal plants are the only species that really span out of the southwest and then go right around the coast. Not all of them, but quite a few of them. And many of them that are found... I can't go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I've got caught there. Um, uh, many of those species um, will creep out of the Perth region and actually go far further latitudinally, both south and north, than what you will get in a piece of ancient woodland where we have quite discrete and compact uh, uh, areas. And you'll see later, that actually presents, I think, wonderful opportunities for the process of natural migration. Again, as we saw in Dave Merritt's talk, seeds can move bigger distances in coastal communities than they do almost in any other community in Western Australia. Now, our species on the coast have all sorts of interesting and unique biologies. And when I refer to unique biology, when I first got interested in coastal work, there, the, the only books I could go to were things on particularly North American East Coast restoration. And all of the stuff in there just didn't apply to what we had. For example, one of the first species we got stuck with was the sword sedge that you can see here. Um, we thought we'd grow that from seed. Well, if we could find seed. In fact, this is a uh, a mature seed head, we put it under an x-ray machine and you can see 
one or two little white dots, they indicate the filled seed, the rest are just empty seed. They're actually naturally empty. They're not predated in most instances. And they're, they're a system, we believe, that we call decoy seeds. And they produce a lot of things that don't have embryos or endosperm, the food of seed inside of them. They're actually put out into the soil to confuse seed predators. And that only one in five or one in 20 <laughs> seeds are actually of any value. And lots of species throughout the southwest also do this decoy seed. Whenever you get a malaluca or a eucalyptus seed capsule, all that packing material that comes out, which you think, well, that's just packing material, may have a function as being a decoy to confuse the seed predators in the system. So lots to learn around these sorts of aspects. And we're gradually seeing through the great work of Ben Croxford and our other propagators and the research groups at the various universities in Kings Park, that we're starting to understand a lot more about those unique characteristics, particularly about how to be more effective with the use of our precious seed resources. Interesting in that seed work, uh, this, this study, although it's a few years back now with prickle bush that you see in the background there, was actually a real eye-opener for us. It's a, as Dave mentioned, it was a species with warm stratification. That means it needed a period of warmth with moisture and then a little period after that, then a chilling period, and then it would start to germinate. And then, of course, in his nursery, he uses that under natural conditions to get germination. The reason that was important was that was the first species recorded in Australia that actually had that phenomenon. Up until that stage, the, the book said, it's all cold stratification. Chill your seed, keep the moisture, and they'll grow. That was the Northern Hemisphere textbook that you can now throw away because we're writing our own here. And of course, with that process, we've been able, and you'll see this June today on the bus tour, uh, doesn't look like that at all. It's actually a really vibrant community. And just uh, la uh, two weeks ago, we had Barbara Knott in there filming uh, the White Wing Fairy Ring all through that area. This little guild has set up home on what was once Nothing more than just a kind of band of sand patch. But an important issue is these, like all of our Western Australian communities that we've all learned so much, whether you're in the wheat belt, ancient woodlands, the Jarrah Forest, the Tuart Forest particularly, where I spent the last three days uh, with a federal assessment uh, panel looking at the Tuart Forest for threatened ecological community status, they are all very vulnerable to all the things that we bring with us. We heard the wonderful quote about Velcro being a nasty material, um, but we've certainly imposed upon these coasts uh, in no short measure huge impacts from weeds, and of course around the Perth region and further we can see those on a large scale. This is a picture of uh, the accountant at the back of the room who asked the question about easier fall filling as accountants <coughs> would. Um, and uh, this was one of those episodic storm events, just in fact at the uh, groin in City Beach. And what we're seeing here, uh, this is Tinnapyrum, the uh, seaweed, uh, uh, weed, and you can see the rhizomes that were excavated. Look how deep they were. What a liability. Weeds that we introduce here are great survivors in the system. They're not going to be easy to solve. We're not saying we have a solution for this one, but it takes great vigilance and patience to eradicate them. And in one of the speakers, um, Dave Merritt, he spoke about white broom, which we've been attempting to eradicate as potentially the new sleep weed for the West Coast, to a plant revered in the Middle East for its high forage value, its wonderful white blossoms and high nectar yield for honey production. You bring it onto our landscape and it's a free for all. And so far, it looks like we can record soil seed banks that may be living 50 to 100 years. So once you allow one seed rain, you have the white broom in that soil substrate waiting to re-emerge. And Cambridge Coast Keters have been removing those from one particular gene for a very long period of time. But there are some solutions, and some of those solutions are about using our local species. Spinifex longer folius, we've heard a great deal about, and we just need to look and observe. And I will re remind people that the reason marum grass was introduced so prolifically in the city beach area was for the simple reason, um, and I spoke to the person in charge of the city of Perth uh, Parks and Gardens Department, that they were called, who reminded me that marum grass was a terrific species that is fantastic along our coastline, and why was I worried about it? Because it's sterile. 
as I've always shown, the fact that it comes up everywhere. The reason they didn't want the spinifex is because they couldn't propagate it. Now we can, but we need to learn that these are species often of sand nourishment areas. You put them in the back June for this uh, Hirschutus, if you don't put it in the four dunes, then the, that plant won't establish. So you've got to look at the plants, understand the position, and then you'll certainly get those uh, uh, situations stabilising themselves. But ultimately, for all of us, and this is uh, David and Junko, uh, two of our um, very intensive planters with Cambridge Coast Care, we, we do face issues of scale along our coastline. Each of us, as working in our local patch to our local bit, and we, we, I think, collectively do an incredible task, but we still have issues that we are talking of hectares to square kilometres that ultimately will need levels of repatriation and remediation. So we need to be thinking in that space. And in thinking in that space, it's also useful to realise that many of our local uh, plant communities of the dune communities are natural regenerators. I wish I could say that of the Vanshaw woodland that grows just behind us here at Bold Park, where we now know that the best place for a species to grow that it's learnt is right where mum used to be. So we don't find a lot of migration and genetic movement of seed in these older communities, but we do find it up and down our coastline. And this is an image I've shown before, 1940, a blowout just north of Durian Bay. This is it at 2000. That is 100% natural regeneration. As that June, uh, that um, um, parabolic June began to slow down, the sand nourishment ceased, and we started getting recolonisation. You clear a patch of wheat belt, as we've been monitoring a site that was cleared and left after only one cropping in uh, just in 1944, and all we've got are a couple of she oaks that come back and nothing else. We are fortunate having systems where with a little bit of assistance, control of the weeds, control of the erosional processes, we can begin quite magical regeneration on, on scales that, that are important. Now I just want to conclude with reminding us all that we're also here as custodians of the future to hand over these wonderful coastal communities that we all want to live on, we all want to enjoy, that, that we're handing them over often to generations unborn. And we've just heard, of course, that um, Ocean Reef, that area there, is to be developed, which I find very disappointing because you can see it's a wonderful area with um, uh, coastal heat going well inland. It has wonderful, um, it's one of our best examples close to Perth of some of the rare coastal heath communities. These are things uh, of the family Ericaceae, you know, the blueberries. Um, I'm hoping there will be a rethink on this whole development because just because it's bush doesn't mean it's expendable. And we're now starting, I think, with the Belia project, or the Row 8. I think the great and tragic uh, um, uh, lesson learned from Belia 8 um, was not so much a lesson, but what Belia 8 has given us through the loss of that bushland is a great appreciation by all Western Australians that what we have is precious, and if we don't look after it, protect it, it will go. And uh, hopefully, whatever is, is planned for here will retain as much as possible. Because what we've done so successfully, and we keep doing it successfully in so many parts of the world, is of course we engineer and we, we interrupt these coastlines. This is where we're going. We're meeting just down at the end here. This is uh, uh, Oceanic Drive just out. This is the City Beach groin. Um, all of this sand movement that you see here has all come as a result of pushing West Coast Highway right along the coast. Of course, we didn't stop there. We started putting infrastructure in there. Um, this is Jubilee Park. You're going to see that in a little while. This is the Fred Burton Car Park, where we're going to go. They, that was the June community there um, that we've started or we restored. This is 2008, where you essentially, we've essentially re-greened much of that environment, but re-greened it, of course, with exotic species. And we thought as Cambridge Coast Care that it's also time for bold steps that, particularly using this inner city coastal environment as a template, there would be great opportunities to look 
and how you might connect areas that have been disconnected. Because as we heard from Sophie with the AMP study, it's so important having connectivity and linking your fragments. It provides the communication, the genetic transfer, and the opportunity for recolonization, as we found with the Splendid Red. And we thought it was a great idea, and it had the uh, unanimous support of the town of Cambridge, that our northern dunes here, with a whole pot of car parks all put in in the 60s, and restaurants and all sorts of belts, to link them with our southern dunes, which go in a continuous belt all the way down uh, to just north of Cottesloe, and um, creep around the Cottesloe uh, uh, beachfront there on the cliff base. We thought it would be a great opportunity to try and connect them so that we could begin biological connections. We came up with the concept BioLink, which stands for Landscape Integration for Natural Connections. And it was built on the great experience of Coast Care at that stage over about 13 years in understanding how to restore plant communities. This is our boardwalk where we will be finishing up the bus tour today, or June 1 as we, we, call, we call it, which is our, our major demonstration June that day is close to the major development. We thought it would be a great idea, in, and this is the southern part, to give things like Splendid Rant a chance to rebuild a bit of a connection through a piece of underutilised uh, lawn area, which we see here on Jubilee Park, and provide an amenity. What we came up with was a plan that was funded by Lotteries West to the tune of $160,000 with council support. It was to be essentially like a botanic garden by the sea, but all local native species that we were going to plant in low plantings. There would be walkways, interpretations. They would illustrate how to be smart with local gardening. As with, well, as you find around this building, all 100% bold park species, there's no water put on these plants. And it's actually a lovely perennial garden. About 15,000 local and attractive species will be put in, access for all, and we were hoping that it was going to become a great haven for all sorts of bird life and other interesting things and a great educational resource. That's what we were proposing. It would be an area coming around there that would link those all up. Funding was in place, all was ready to go, but then we found others had alternative values for that area. And I'll leave you to quietly read the comments from a certain sector of the community who thought that putting native things back into our dunes was in fact the wrong thing to do, that grass in fact was better. The rush to be green by ripping out recreational open spaces and creating a natural bush vegetation. So the interesting thing in the comments that you see here is that all of us sit here already uh, in many respects converted to an understanding of the values of what we've got. But there are people in the community who need to be taken on their own journeys, often one by one on one. And I'm not saying had we taken the antagonist of BioLink on that journey, we would have succeeded. But we, we've learned as a Coast Care group a very serious lesson as we handed back the $160,000 to Lotteries West and the council unanimously overturned their previous decision to let BioLink go ahead. So, your elected representatives are important in the process. You need to lobby them. We needed to talk to them a lot more. We needed to have them on the journey. And we needed to get to a broader part of the community. Finally, this is one of our template dunes. We set up as a restoration site 12 years ago. Stuart Knott, um, who we set up the Stuart Knott Memorial Scholarship for uh, some years ago who, who died of uh, melanoma, of cancers linked to melanoma, was a great advocate for protecting this area. In the background you can see the restaurant precinct that runs along and um, he was a great advocate that the Fred Burton dunes need to be protected. Oh, I have to finish. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately there was a need for car parking. 11 years of restoration as you will see here, this area. And I don't even know if I can get that I can't get the video. Um, this was October 25th last year. We lost two hectares of our uh, June property. So the video won't go. That's a scraping game. It was a very wrenching point for all of us. 
there was a level of dialogue but not a level of understanding of the great value and, and of course that's it and uh, a few weeks later and today I'll show you uh, the car park that's gone in there. So not that I want us to be on a negative note but we all need to understand as we learn with Belia, as we keep learning about this precious country, we have to keep going. We have to leave the future generations something of greater value than we find today. And someone said something similar, we're here to shape the future and not fear it. So um, let's be a bit buoyant as we uh, have our quick uh, uh, afternoon tea. Um, but importantly, some special thanks to Annette, who's in the red top running out the door. <laughs> she has been absolutely fabulous in doing the catering, for the liaising with you. Uh, to Adeline and the team at Perth NRM for uh, the tri booking system, for all the assistance for Kate, uh, to Craig, uh, to Lyle, who's managed the complexities of um, getting the money and then giving it back to you, which has been interesting to Hamish, Veronica Newbury for Kings Park for allowing us use of this room today free of charge. Robert Benkin and Sophie who helped set up. Um, and finally, the great lineup of speakers who've given their time today. And finally, but not least, you have a little bit of a chore to do. We'd ask you if you could pack your chairs just to help us, because we have to have all the chairs packed and put away before we get on the buses. So enjoy the tour, and we can speak a lot more later afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.